Ladies and gentlemen, this is Jimmy Wallington. Owing to the illness of Mr. Dick Powell, the motion picture story Mrs. Mike will not be heard on Screen Director's Playhouse tonight as scheduled. However, we are proud to bring you two of Hollywood's most brilliant stars who were to have been heard November 30th. Screen Director's Playhouse stars Dorothy McGuire, Charles Boyer, production Clooney Brown, director Ernst Lubitsch, This is the Screen Director's Playhouse, the Thursday night feature on NBC's five-show festival of comedy, music, mystery, and drama. Brought to you by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. The makers of Anison, for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia. And by your local Ford dealer, who is displaying the new 1951 Ford, the car that's built for the years ahead. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, before we present Clooney Brown, here's a word from RCA Victor. For my money, the most amazing creatures on Earth today are ten-year-olds with television sets at their command. Presumably, while lying in wait for their favorite desperados, they casually become authorities on what bills are now before Congress, who won the Nobel Prizes, where the UN forces are today, and precisely what the electron finds so attractive in the proton. Oh, let's face it. The television child at ten knows more about how the world wags than his father knew at twenty. Seriously, it's mighty important to give your children the incomparable advantage of education by television. Not just someday, but now. Naturally, you'll want the incomparable set. America's favorite, already proven in over a million homes. An RCA Victor. See your RCA Victor dealer tomorrow and choose from 18 beautiful new million-proof models, the RCA Victor masterpiece, which will be not only the greatest amusement center any man ever knew but the greatest classroom any man's children ever attended. Now for the first act of Clooney Brown. But may I add that at the end of the program, there will be an announcement of importance to Hollywood and to motion picture audiences everywhere. Here now is Clooney Brown, starring Charles Boyer in his original role and Dorothy McGuire as Clooney. Uh, Hello. Is this Mr. Porritt, uh, the plumber? Oh, I beg your pardon, miss. Is Mr. Porritt there? Yes, I know it's Sunday. My dear young lady, it's Sunday for me, too. I like to rest on Sundays. Everybody likes to rest on Sundays. But it's the sink. It won't drain. And I've got 30 people coming for cocktails. No, no, I don't plan to serve them in the sink. But I'd like to have a glass washed when the party is over. Look, I've tried every plumber in London. One of them promised to come right over. That was two hours ago. But look here, I can't call up 30 guests and tell them my sink stinks. I certainly can't. I certainly can't, and I don't have to. Run along, miss. Have a nice punt on the Thames. The plumber's at the door now. Congratulate me. So long. Uh, Come in. Come in. Never been so happy to see anyone in my whole life. Uh, Right this way. Oh, thank you. Uh, I hate to spoil your Sunday like this, but with me, well, it's sink or swim. Uh, Come along. (laughs) Thank you. Well, there it is. Huh? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, it is. Interesting. Very interesting. It is. Could there be anything more fascinating than a sink out of order? Well, no, I've never thought of it in quite that way. In ordinary? Everyday commonplace kitchen sink. And yet, 
the height of human frustration. Look at it. Look at it without prejudice, my dear sir. You start the day with an infinite capacity for living. Then, somewhere along the line, your social and personal plumbing goes wrong. And the best of you ends in the sink. The best of your youth, the best of your hopes, the best of your efforts. Pure waste. An ocean of defeated humanity. Believe me, I know a lot about sinks. Well, I should hope so. I... And your guests are arriving in a minute? Right. Oh, and you want your sink fixed? Right. Well, then what you need is a plumber. Right. <laughs> a what? Aren't you, I mean... Huh? Oh, oh, no, oh, I'm not, no. No matter what you mean. No, I, I came here to see my old friend, uh, Professor Lee. Professor Lee is in Scotland. I've sublet this apartment... Oh, what a mess. Well, I must say, that's a mess for me, too. Yeah, but what am I going to do? You're the most selfish man I've ever seen. What? Of course you are. Well, you don't even know me. And already you're not interested in me. Why don't you ask me why I want to see Professor Lee? Why don't you ask me about my landlady? Is she humane or does she want a rent? Do you know? Do you care? <laughs> no. Have you even said a fig for my guests, my dear sir? Is there something I can do for you? Is there? Oh, thank heaven I misjudged you. Do you know Professor Lee, Ames? Uh, not very well. Ah, magnificent fellow. He would have said, is there anything wrong, Bilinski? And of course I would have said no, no, nothing. But he would not have believed me. He had the most charming way of forcing 20 pounds on one. Made you feel you were doing him a favor. Remarkable fellow. Obviously. Well, I'm not precisely in the habit of forcing things on people, but... Oh, also... my dear Ames, this is kind of you. Uh, Twenty will be quite enough. Oh, not at all. Uh, you can stay for cocktails? Oh. Thank the Lord. I, I mean, thank the Lord if that isn't a guest. I'm sure that's the plumber. Excuse me. Hello. Hello. Well, shall we have a go at it? Are you sure you have the right apartment? Well, it's the right number. You're Mr. Ames, all right. I could smell you a mile off. You're the gentleman who phoned all right? Uh, are you a plumber? Oh, no, sir. But I've been around pipes and sewers and faucets and things ever since I came to live with my Uncle Arn, Mr. Porrett, that is. You called him. And I talked to you? Yes, sir. But I've watched him work a lot, and he's a good plumber, too. But if you ask me, he's much too conservative. Conservative? Yes, although he votes labor. But when it comes to pipes, he takes the long road. He fiddles and faddles and he turns a nut, gets a drop here and a drip there, when one good bang might turn the trick in a jiffy. Yes, and might smash the pipe to smithereens, too. Now, why don't you let me take a whack at it? Oh, no, you don't. No amateur is going to put my house underwater. Oh, my dear Ames. Where is the gypsy in you? Where is your sense of adventure? Are you the sort of man who puts on his pants before he answers the telephone? <laughs> what if it does go wrong? What if the whole place gets flooded and there is no party? You save your liquor. Is that bad? But if this girl succeeds... Please do let me try. No, come on, then. It's in here. <gasps> My! Isn't it a beauty? What a congestion. It is stuffed up, isn't it? I never thought it'd be as good as this. Oh, I can't thank you enough, Mr. Ames. Don't mention it. Well... Enough talk. Let's get to work. Good day, gentlemen. It's been a very pleasant chat. I'll see you when I come up. Here we go. Cool down here. Very nice indeed. Oh, what's she doing? Sounds most promising. Have you ever had tea at the Ritz? Eh? <laughs> Did you say tea at the Ritz? Yes, I have. Last Saturday. I was lying in bed sucking oranges to tone up the system, you know. And all at once I said to myself, Clooney Brown, you've got a pound note in your stocking. Why don't you have tea at the Ritz? And so I did. That's the way things come over me. What? She sucks oranges. Tones up the system. Was it a good tea? What? I said, was it a good tea? Oh, it wasn't the tea. But to hear them say this way, miss, please, miss, crumpets, miss, and holding my chair for me. You never would have thought for a minute I was out of place. Uh, Miss, um... Clooney. Uh, Clooney, tell me, what made you think you were out of place at the Ritz? I didn't. It was 
is Uncle Arn. He's always and forever telling me, Clooney Brown, you don't know your place. Clooney Brown, you ought to learn your place. And what does Uncle Arn think your place is? He didn't say. Because he doesn't know. Who can tell you where your place is? Where's my place? Where's anybody's place? I'll tell you where it is. Wherever you're happy, that's your place. And happiness is something that only you can identify. You're the sole judge. Now look, Clooney. In Hyde Park, for instance... Some people like to feed nuts to the squirrels. But if it makes you happy to feed squirrels to the nuts, who am I to say nuts to the squirrels? <laughs> you mind saying that all over again? I say in high... Look, you two, I don't like to intrude, but do you realize what time it is? Oh, look at it. Oh, look at it drain. Oh, she's a beautiful thing. You see, my dear Ames, faith moves mountains and sinks. Wonderful. But I think a toast is in order, Mr. Ames. A toast to the new master plumber and the as good as new sink. Perfect. We'll test the drinks for the guests. Come on, Miss Brown. <laughs> What a wonderful day this has been for me. My first sink and my first cocktail. A martini cocktail with an olive. <laughs> Have some more. Uh, should she? Oh, definitely. Oh, yes. Thank you. I feel absolutely lovely. <laughs> I can't quite describe it. I feel uh, chirrupy. Chirrupy? I don't recall ever feeling chirrupy. I'm afraid you never will, Miss Raines. I'm sure there isn't a chirrup in you. <laughs> Oh, isn't that funny? Now I feel entirely different. I know what it is. It's coming over me. That Persian cat feeling. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I don't mean to be inhospitable, but it's getting late. It's never too late for a cat. You know how it feels? <laughs> to be a cat? I can tell you. You lie stretched out in bed reading the wonderful travelogue and the Daily Mail. And wanting to go places and wondering if you ever will. And all of a sudden, you're a cat. And you stretch and you arch your back and you yawn and stroke your silky fur and purr. Wow. <laughs> oh, it is so wonderful to be a cat and to read the Daily Mail. I knew it. I knew it. There they are. Uh, would you mind, Miss Brown? Oh. Yes? Uh, what is it? Oh, I feel so wonderful. So Clooney Brown, what are you doing here? It's Uncle Arn. What does this mean? What are you doing here on that couch? Well, I've been plumbing, Uncle Arn. Has something happened here I ought to know about? Well, I don't think so. Hmm. Lucky I found this address written down or I might never have looked you in the face again. Ah, oh, no, I assure you, Uncle Arn. Name's Porritt. Mr. Porritt. Hmm. Clooney, you got liquor on your breath. Oh. Strong liquor. You don't know your place. You never will know your place. Get your things. But, Uncle Arn, what is my place? What's anybody's place? If you want to feed nuts to the squirrels, who am I to say, do you? That settles it. <laughs> You're going to service. And right now. Come along. Uh, I don't like to bring it up, Mr. Pollard, but I haven't paid your niece. You can't buy me off with a filthy pound note. Keep it. Come home now, Clooney Brown. Goodbye, gentlemen. I've had a very pleasant stop. And thank you for everything. Today, many thousands of people are thankful to their physicians or dentists for first having introduced them to that remarkable preparation called anison, which brings such incredibly fast and effective relief from the pains of headaches, neuritis, and neuralgia. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Thus, in using anison, you are following sound principles. So ask for Anison at your drug counter next time you suffer pains from headaches, neuritis, or neuralgia. Try these tablets on this guarantee. If you don't feel Anison gives you all the relief you want, as fast as you want it, 
your money will be refunded. Easy-to-take Anison tablets are available everywhere in handy boxes of 12 and 30 and economical family size bottles of 50 and 100. I'll repeat the name for you. Anison. A-N-A-C-I-N. Now, back to the second act of the Screen Director's Playhouse production of Clooney Brown, starring Dorothy McGuire and Charles Boyer. I stayed for Mr. Ames' cocktail party, at least part of it. But when the noise rose to a tumult and the smoke began to form in clouds, I slipped quietly into a back bedroom and lay down on the bed and dozed off. I don't know how long I'd been sleeping when I heard cautious voices whispering. I thought I heard my name. I tell you, it's Belinsky. Not Adam Belinsky. Yes, Adam Belinsky, the Czech. He's a great man. He's famous. Of course he is. He's a writer. Professor at Prague. Oh, that's why the Nazis are after him. He's probably just a jump ahead of them right now. wonder how he got to London. Oh, the underground, no doubt. <clears throat> oh. Oh, hello. 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 <laughs> we know who you are. You can trust us. I'm Andrew Carmel. I'm John Fruin. Uh, oh, how do you do? It, we don't mean to pry, but you are in trouble, aren't you? Eh? Well, uh, yes. <laughs> As a matter of fact... Unless a miracle happens, I'm a man without a home. Oh, that beast. That terrible beast of a Hitler. It, well, I, I wonder if I've made myself clear. Oh, perfectly. But the time for talk is past. We must do something. Oh, I'm afraid you are a little confused. Oh, we know how busy you must be. But believe me, we wouldn't interfere. We would just provide you with a safe place to work. Out at Friars Carmel, with my mother and father. Sir Henry and Lady Carmel. Yes. Oh, well, uh, don't you think you, you should know a little more about me? You are very kind, but uh, I think you are being too impulsive. These are impulsive days, Professor. Someday the world will thank us for it. Well, I hope so, Andrew. I shall be happy to come with you. With my deepest gratitude. After all, as you see, my safety is most important to me, too. <laughs> told me I was going into domestic service, he wasn't fooling. He found me a job at once. And before I knew what I was doing, I found myself getting instructed on how to be a parlor maid at the home of Lord and Lady Carmel. On my first night, I was sent into the dining room, staggering under a huge silver tray of mutton. Professor, it's a pleasure to have you here. Oh, how very hospitable you are. But I don't feel I should accept before you know more about me. But Andrew has told us all about you. Fine lad, your son, Andrew. Oh, yes, yes. I'm rather fond of him myself. Mm, uh, sits his horse well. Then there is only one thing I can say. This land of such dear souls. This dear, dear land. This blessed plot. This earth. This realm. This England. Well, a toast to Shakespeare. Oh, how charming of you, Professor. And how well you speak English. It rolls right out of him. Oh, you have fascinated Henry, Professor. Uh, come now, take some of the roast, dear. Brown. Brown, the roast. Oh, 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 oh yes. Hmm? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Well, this is a likely cut. Uh-uh. What? Don't take that piece, sir. This one on the right's much better. What? Well, it hasn't so much fat, and it's browner and bigger. You won't regret it, sir. Oh, really? Oh, all right, all right. Thank you, sir. The roast, sir? Why, thank you. Oh, no. Not you, not you. Nuts to the squirrels. <laughs> Go to the kitchen, Brown, at once. I'm very sorry, milady. Outrageous. It's preposterous. It strikes me absolutely speechless. A maid choosing my mutton for me. She will be dismissed immediately, sir. No, no, no. One moment, Sir Henry. Uh, you, you took the piece she suggested. May I ask why? Why, uh, because the other piece had a blob of fat on it. And this one is browner, leaner, and bigger. And you liked it better. But, uh, hang it all. 
just isn't done. What a pity. It should have been done long ago. Does it occur to you that for generations, the lords of Carmel have probably eaten the wrong piece of mutton? Hmm? Well, uh, that's a very interesting way of looking at it. But... Well, she needn't have dropped the platter and insulted my guest. What did she say to you? Uh, I remember very well, sir. It was, if I may take the liberty of repeating it, nuts to the squirrels. Doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't. It should have been squirrels to the nuts. But uh, I have an open mind, and if someone says to me, nuts to the squirrels, I accept it. You may be inclined to say it to me yourself someday when you know me better, and I'm not so sure you'll include the squirrels. Mm. <laughs> oh, uh, that's too deep for me, Belinsky. <clears throat> if I may say so, your ladyship, the sooner the young woman is dismissed, the better. Please, please, Monsieur Siret. I know that in the policies of the kitchen, the balance of power rests with you. I also know that as a guardian of English customs and traditions, this young woman has offended your sensibilities. But permit me to quote someone to whom everything English was all so dear. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven. Well, another toast to Shakespeare. You've made a charming evening for us, Professor. I've never seen my husband more stimulated. Well, he is a very stimulating man himself. Yes, yes, he is. I hope you'll be comfortable. Sorette will valet you. Oh, I'm sorry, but dear Lady Carmel, I have so little to offer a valet. Oh, well, would you mind letting Sirette do it anyway, so as not to hurt his feelings? Oh, so, oh very well. I, I have this suit and uh, Andrew's dinner jacket, which you have uh, offered to lend me. They are both at Sirette's disposal. Oh, thank you. I hope you sleep well, Professor. Uh, oh, by the way, there's a nightingale under your window. Oh, you shouldn't have gone through so much trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, good night, Professor. Good night, Lady Carmel. Who is it? It's me, Clooney. Let me in. Oh, Clooney. Oh, I'm so sorry I upset you. Well, how do you do, Mr. Belensky? Oh, you shouldn't be here. But for heaven's sake, how did you get here? To Friars Carmel, of all places. Tell me, what happened? Well, it's it's all, Uncle Arn. Oh, Mr. Belensky. Oh, no, no, Clooney. Look at me. I'm here, too. I haven't even got an uncle. And after all, you're, you're at least a maid. I'm only a guest. Oh, I don't want to be a maid. I'll go on and on, dropping platters, putting hot water bottles into cold beds and... Having Wednesday afternoon off in a village where the cinema opens only at night. But what about me, Clooney? I'm a city man. I like crowds and traffic and lights, smoke in my lungs. What have I got? A big mouth nightingale right under my window. <laughs> oh, it, it's so good to talk to someone who's out of place, too. Yes, yes, Clooney. Please talk to me at any time. Open your heart to me. Ditto. Mr. Belensky. No, no, Clooney. Come into my arms. Oh, Mr. Belensky. Oh. Oh, I, I didn't mean... Oh, please forgive me, Mr. Belensky. I, I don't know what came over me. No. It, it isn't as if you were my type. Believe me, you aren't. Oh, so, oh I'm sure I'm not. <laughs> I understand perfectly. You were just happy to find a friend here. And so am I. We must go on being friends. And as we are not our types, uh, that should be easy. You know, we're just like two people on a desert island, waiting for a ship to rescue us. That's right, Clooney, that's right. But uh, you know how it is on a desert island. Mm -hmm. You wait and wait. Then you don't wait anymore. <laughs> Clooney Brown, let's admit it. We are in danger. Today, we are not our types. But, you know, as time passes, we might not look so bad to each other. <laughs> if we are in Friars Carmel long enough, who knows? You might even find me possible 
And I might find you the most beautiful creature in the whole county. It's not much of a county, but that's all we have. <laughs> oh, Mr. Belensky, this must never happen. You must never become a victim of my circumstances. And if you should ever seem romantic to me, don't hesitate. Just kick me. Yes, that's it. Let's kick each other. <laughs> it's a pact. Oh, I feel so safe. Good. Well, now I'd better go. Yes, it would be terrible if they heard us. Who? Oh, anybody, but especially Mr. Surrett and Mrs. Miley. Well, thank you for everything. Oh, I feel so good. So do I. I wish I were back in that apartment where we were. Oh, I wish I could roll up my sleeves and roll down my stockings and unloosen the joint. Bang, bang, bang. <laughs> I know how you feel. Well, I'll go to my room now and let the nightingale bang me to sleep. Good night, Jenny. <laughs> Well, Mrs. Maley. I agree with you, Mr. Surrett. What can one expect? A maid with no references and a foreigner who isn't even in the diplomatic service. Uh, <sighs> good night, Mr. Surrett. Good night, Mrs. Maley. <laughs> Tony Brown. Oh, hello, Mr. Belensky. Well, look at you. Violets on your shoulder, yes. roses in your cheeks, and a garden on your head. What's the occasion? Well, don't you know? It's your birthday. It's my day off, from three to seven. Oh, of course. Perfect, perfect. No wonder I've always loved Wednesday. From three to seven. Four hours, all to ourselves. <laughs> Two hundred and forty minutes. And if you think of it in seconds, I'll cancel all my engagements. In fact, I'll ignore them. Clooney, the village is ours. Well, Mr. Belinsky, it's awfully sweet of you, but I, I think I should tell you. Something has happened. What? Well, you know Mrs. Miley suffers from rheumatism. You haven't caught it, have you? Oh, no. But you see, if Mrs. Miley hadn't sent me to the chemist shop for pear trees liniment, I, I might never have met Mr. Wilson, the chemist. Oh, well, that's the way things happen. Think of it. Mrs. Maley's swollen knee might change my whole life. Is it that bad, Clooney? Well, I don't know. But what would you think if a gentleman invited you to tea and to meet his mother, too? I wouldn't go. <laughs> I've already accepted. And I'm certain I did the right thing. Hmm. I'm sure you did. You know, Mr. Wilson's the only chemist around here for miles and miles. Oh, it's so exciting to meet a man who's surrounded by hundreds of bottles. And every one of them, life and death. Mr. Wilson hinted that when we get better acquainted, he'd let me watch him make up a prescription. But this is confidential. Your secret will be buried with me. Well, Clooney, it looks as if your shape has come in. Oh. Hmm. The bottle of beer I was going to offer you seems awfully flat beside all those bottles filled with magic. Well, I hope the magic will make you happy, Clooney. Very happy. Ladies and gentlemen, tomorrow morning your Ford dealer will display the finest Ford ever produced. It's the new 1951 Ford that's built for the years ahead. Your Ford dealer wants you to see this great new car. When you do you'll find that it offers 43 new look-ahead features. And we call them look-ahead features because, like the car itself, they're advantages designed to give you long-lasting satisfaction. Among them, you'll discover the new automatic ride control that automatically adjusts the ride to the road to give you a level ride, an easy ride. You'll find the automatic mileage maker that saves gas by squeezing the last mile out of every drop. You'll see new luxury lounge interiors with a wide choice of rich Ford Craft upholstery fabrics in harmonizing colors. Visit your Ford dealer tomorrow and check all 43 look-ahead features. And you'll agree that you can pay more, but you can't buy better than the 51 Ford. 
You are listening to the Screen Director's Playhouse, one of five great radio shows that are brought to you by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television, the Whitehall Pharmacal Company, makers of Anison, Kalinos, Bicidol, and other fine drug products, and by your local Ford dealer, who is displaying the new 1951 Ford, the car that's built for the years ahead. The Screen Director's Playhouse presentation of Clooney Brown, starring Charles Boyer and Dorothy McGuire, will continue after a short pause for station identification. Stay tuned to your local station on NBC. for the third act of the Screen Director's Playhouse production of Clooney Brown, starring Charles Boyer and Dorothy McGuire. I stood on the village square looking after Clooney. Her step was light, her very feet were singing a song as she disappeared through the little door of Mr. Wilson's chemist shop. And now, let's repeat it again, Mrs. Watkins. Uh, Tilt Master Richard's head back and squeeze one drop of the astringent into each nostril uh, three times a day. Will his nose stop running, Mrs. Watkins? It may interest you to know that after the use of one bottle of my nasal bath, the Marquis of Rockamere, a distinguished speaker, was for the first time clearly understood when he addressed the House of Lords last week. The charge will be two shillings. Good day. Good afternoon, Miss Brown. Good afternoon, Mr. Wilson. Well, Miss Brown, I could uh, relish a crumpet or two. And you? Ditto. Then uh, shall we step into the parlor? Oh, Mr. Wilson, didn't you notice anything? Uh, Notice uh, what? Well, the way I look. Well, I remarked about it the last time I saw you. I said you looked intelligent. That's not what I mean. I, I, I mean here, the garden on my head. Oh. Well, uh, I don't object to it myself, Miss Brown, but uh, my mother might think it a little uh, frivolous. Oh. Well, then I had better take it off. Thank you. Uh, I hope you understand. Oh, I do. I should have been satisfied to look intelligent. Shall we go? It's right through this door. Oh, what an elegant room. Oh, well, it's not Buckingham Palace, but it's uh, Wilson's Little Castle. (laughs) You might enjoy looking at this picture, Miss Brown. It's uh, painted by hand. Poor little sheep. It hasn't much future, has it? Just mutton. And where would England be without it? Now, if I were a sheep, I'd be proud to serve the Empire. And now, Miss Brown, uh, would you like to know where we are? Well, yes, I would. Well, then let's have a little glance at the map of our valley. Why, just look at that. Are those battle flags? Not exactly, Miss Brown, but a victory, nevertheless. Uh, This flag marks where I was born. Yes. And this flag here is where we are at this very moment. Oh. And this is where I intend to remain for the rest of my life, in this very house. Oh, you have it all so perfectly planned. But what if the house burns down? I have considered that too. It won't. I've taken every precaution. You may have noticed the lightning rod on the roof. That's Moulton's imperial pinpoint, the very best. And if I should ever be blessed with uh, little Wilsons, I should expect (coughs) Mrs. Wilson to keep matches away from them. That isn't asking too much now, is it? Oh, no. I think that's the least Mr. Wilson could expect from Mrs. Wilson. Yes, However, if, in spite of all my provisions, a slight blaze should occur, it may reassure you to know that I am chief of the Friars Carmel Volunteer Fire Department. Mr. Wilson, you aren't. I am. Oh, it would be almost worth a fire to see you in action. Thank you, Miss Brown. Now, uh, I shall call my mother. 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 (laughs) Mother. 
Mother has been arresting. Yes, indeed. Well, Mother, uh, here is our guest, <clears throat> Miss Brown, my mother. How do you do, Mrs. Wilson? <coughs> well, I have tea all ready, Mother. Will you pour for us? <laughs> and I, Miss Brown, if you have no objection, will play something on the harmonium. <coughs> Is there anything you don't do, Mr. Wilson? <laughs> well, I, uh, uh, you have your choice, uh, a sweet Alice Ben Bolt or uh, a flow gently, a sweet Afton. They're both so beautiful. I wish you would decide for me, Mr. Wilson. Well, uh, shall we say a uh, sweet Alice <coughs> and uh, perhaps uh, a sweet Afton as an encore? Are you ready, Miss Brown? Oh, yes. Mother's taken a great liking to you. Well, how do you know? She didn't say anything. That's the point. Mother doesn't waste words on flattery. If she speaks, it's to correct faults. Oh. Well, I like your mother, too. Once or twice, I thought she was going to smile at me. Rooney! <laughs> Oh, it's Mr. Belinsky. Hello, Mr. Belinsky. This is Mr. Wilson, the chemist. How do you? How do you do? Mr. Belinsky's staying at Friars Carmel. Oh. You're a friend or relative of Mrs. Maley or Mr. Sirrett, I suppose, Mr. Belinsky? Oh, no. He's a guest of Sir Henry and Lady Carmel. A, a guest? I understand Mr. Wilson's surprise. A guest is not usually aware of the existence of a maid... That's what troubled you, Mr. Wilson, wasn't it? Oh, exactly, sir. Well, you see, we at Friars Carmel don't regard Miss Brown merely as a maid. We are very proud of our Clooney and uh, interested in her welfare. And above all, in her friends. Oh, naturally. I understand, sir. Uh, well, um, it's seven o'clock, Miss Brown. Yes. Oh, how time flies. Yes, it does, but we must learn to fly with it. Oh, I know. I I'll loop along now. Goodbye, Mr. Wilson. Goodbye, Miss Brown. Thanks for a wonderful afternoon. And, and for sweet Alice Ben Bolt. Oh, don't mention it. Yes, a very worthy young lady. Yes. I'd like a word with you, Mr. Wilson. I'm entirely at your disposal, sir. Uh, you are a chemist, I believe? Uh, yes, sir. Certified? Oh, yes, sir. My uh, diploma is at your disposal. Hmm. I may have a look at it sometime. Thank you, sir. I was first in my class, if I may say so. How many were there in your class? A Twenty-three, sir. Hmm, not a small class. Uh, Mr. Wilson, I presume that you have weighed your intentions toward Miss Brown as carefully as you weigh the contents of a pill? Oh, I assure you, sir, I am not the sort of man who would invite a young lady for tea merely to a while away an afternoon. I'm glad to hear it, Wilson. I have no use for light-minded men. Nor I, sir. Would it be presumptuous to ask you to say a word in my behalf to Mrs. Maley? What? Have you intentions toward Mrs. Maley, too? Oh, heaven for fins. <laughs> well, I must admit I was worried about Clooney, but you have relieved my fears. Mr. Wilson, you could not have prescribed a better sedative than yourself. Oh. Thank you, sir. Not at all. Good night, Mr. Wilson. Uh, good night, sir. Oh, Mr. Wilson. Oh, yes. Yes, sir. You don't drink, do you? Oh, no, sir. Good. That we couldn't stand. <laughs> it took me a big whiskey and soda to get over Mr. Wilson. I sent a note to Clooney telling her to bring a hot water bottle or something to my room that I had to talk to her. I began composing my speech. <laughs> this romance was fantastic. How could she stand the man? I started to speak to an empty chair. Now, sit down, Clooney. Now, look here. I know we have a pact. Now, le let me tell you something about pacts. Pacts are made for two reasons. One, to be kept. Two, to be broken. Now, no, I don't say let's break our pact. But, on the other hand, I'm not suggesting that we keep it. <laughs> 
Mr. Belinsky. I came as soon as I could. Sit down, sit down, Clooney. <laughs> How do you like Mr. Wilson? Do you still think my ship has arrived? Now, look here, Clooney. Out there is an ocean. And on the ocean is a boat. Braving the storm and battling the billows. <laughs> That's not Mr. Wilson. But in a quiet harbor, there is a freighter. Its engine is turned off. No smoke comes out of its funnel. <laughs> its anchor rests deep on the bottom. It's moored to the pier with a hundred ropes. Nothing could ever budge it. Neither wind no wave. Well, <laughs> that's Mr. Wilson. Oh, I'm so glad you liked him. Uh, <laughs> you know, Mr. Belensky, when I sat in his parlor and everything cozy and peaceful, so homey, and Mr. Wilson playing the harmonium, I got all choked up. And then his mother started to snore. To snore? Oh, you like that? Well, not just the snoring, but because she was his mother. You see, I'm an orphan, and I've never heard my mother snore. Well, you're happy now. That's all that matters. Oh, Mr. Belinsky, it's so selfish of me to talk only about myself. But I'm sure your ship will come in someday, too. Don't worry about me, Clooney. If it doesn't come, I'm a good swimmer. Good night, Clooney. <laughs> I worked very hard from then on. I didn't drop any trays, and I was most respectful to Mrs. Maley and Mr. Surrett. And every Wednesday, Mr. Wilson would stop by just at the stoke of three. I, I hoped I was making a good impression on him, although sometimes I felt that I wasn't quite being myself. One Wednesday, Mr. Wilson told me he was giving his mother a birthday party at night, and he invited me. I didn't know how I was to get the evening off, so I went to Mr. Belinsky for help. He didn't even ask any question. He just went to work. Well, the evening is yours, Clooney. Oh, you are a friend, Mr. Belinsky. You see, it's not only Mrs. Wilson's birthday, but, uh, well, things have sort of been happening. Why, Clooney? Yes, they have. Mr. Wilson has spoken to his mother about me. Well, I'm sure she approved of you. Well, anyhow, she didn't say no. Oh, that's very encouraging. And then Mr. Wilson asked his aunt and Mr. Latham, his solicitor, and everybody he possibly could ask. Did and he they... ask you? Oh, no. That's just it. <laughs> But he might tonight. Or he might not. That's the suspense. Yes, and so romantic, Clooney. Mr. Belensky, I... What? No, no, I can't well, tell you. Well, you're not keeping secrets from me, are you? Oh, it isn't a secret, but I shouldn't tell you anyway. But I'm going to. I had a dream last night. But, but you won't tell Mr. Wilson. Why, did he forbid you to dream? Forbid? Well, how could he? <laughs> oh, no. But Mr. Wilson's so sensible, and I, I don't think he'd object to dreams as long as they were sensible, but I dreamed about you. Uh, Clooney, you did? Hmm. You don't know how wonderful you look in affairs. Hey. And how you rode that black Arabian standard. <laughs> we, you just burned up the sand. And you swooped me off the desert and set me right in front of you in the saddle. My, did we sit that horse well. Tell me, Clooney. Tell me, did... Did I... Did I take you to my tent? Well... <laughs> you were taking me somewhere. But I remembered our pack just in time, and I kicked myself. Oh, and took the kick right out of the dream. Mr. Belensky, do you wish I had gone to your tent? Hmm? No. No, Clooney. You did the right thing. I have no tent. Not on the desert or anywhere. Let her alone now. Good luck. Same to you. And thanks for getting me off for the birthday party. Mother, friends, as the Romans so aptly put it, a tempora a mutanta, that is to say, a times a change. 
Uh, 65 years ago, Mother wasn't even here. And today, she's been here 65 years. <laughs> Tempora certainly do, mutata. <laughs> Thank you. But uh, before we examine those 65 uh, well-spent years... Uh, let me thank you all who came here to celebrate this uh, joyous occasion. You, Mr. Snaffle, Mrs. Snaffle, Miss Snaffle, Master Snaffle. Uh, oh, Master Snaffle is out of the room uh, temporarily. Mm. Uh, Mr. Tuppum, Mrs. Tuppum, and uh, Latham Esquire. Perhaps you notice that I am guilty of an omission, but... When you hear later what I have to say, or better, to announce concerning a young lady not too far away, then I'm sure that you'll agree that sometimes an omission is an head mission. I, uh, uh... I didn't do it. It's the plumbing. I just turned on the faucet. Well, bar quiet. It's the plumbing, Mama. Don't say that. But it was. It was. Well, sit down and be quiet. Uh, let us go on, shall we? Well, bar. Yes, Miss Clooney? Come here. As I was saying, a 65 years of faithful service to the community. <laughs> All I did was turn the faucet and run. Oh, it's probably the joint. 65 years of unblemished reputation. I can fix it. I beg your pardon. Some of you might not know it, but I'm a plumber's niece. Just give me a hammer and a wrench and I'll show you. I'll get it, Miss Clooney. Oh, please, Miss Clooney. I wish you oh, wouldn't. There's nothing to it. It won't take more than five minutes. And then nothing will interrupt your announcement. Oh, well, I, I might not be the best cook uh, in, in England of, of tripe and onion, but whoever gets me doesn't have to worry about his plumbing. Hold these tools for me, Wilbur, while I roll up my sleeves and roll down my stockings. I wasn't dressed for plumbing tonight. There. There you are, Miss Clooney. If it's the joint, a couple of bangs might do it. If not, we'll try something else. She's done it! Oh, I've seen it! It's running! That's my birthday gift to your mother, Mr. Wilson. <laughs> Mrs. Wilson, I hope that... Why, where is she? My mother asked to be excused... Oh, what's the matter? Is she ill? Uh, my Mr. Wilson, it is getting late. Yes, isn't it? We'd better be going. I hope it wasn't too much for your mother, my boy. I hope not. Good night, Mr. Wilson. It was a lovely party. Good night. Uh, good night, Mr. Wilson. Good night. Good night, my boy. Thanks for a charming <laughs> evening. Good night. Thanks for letting me watch, Clooney. Oh, oh, oh you were a great help. Wilbur? All right, I'm coming. Good night, Mr. Wilson. Good night. Never seen one so Did I do something wrong? I wish I had never seen what I saw. But I only wanted to help. I would rather not discuss anything until you have made yourself presentable. Oh, oh I am sorry, Mr. Wilson. I'll, I'll roll down my sleeves. <laughs> Good morning, Mrs. Mealy. Uh, good morning, Mr. Surrette. I did not see Brown as I passed through the kitchen. Your tea, Mr. Surrette. Oh, thank you. I'm afraid Brown is indisposed this morning, Mr. Surrette. Uh, I should not have permitted her to have had last night off. It was entirely my fault, Mr. Surrette. Not at all, Mrs. Mealy. It was a direct request of Sir Henry through the intervention of his foreign guest. Good morning. Oh, good, good morning, morning, sir. Oh, please, please don't get up. Go on with your breakfast. Uh, uh, Sir Henry's at breakfast on the terrace, sir. Oh, I've had mine. I've been in the village doing some shopping. I must go back to London today, and I have wanted to say goodbye to you both. Oh, that's very kind of you, sir. You know, I will miss you, Sirette. And so will my worn suit. Oh, this is for you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, shall I uh, pack your things, sir? Mm, oh, yes, that would be very kind. At once, sir. And this is for you, Mrs. Maley. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Where is Clooney? I'm afraid the birthday party was a bit too much for her. Oh, I see. Don't you think she's a fortunate girl, sir? It's not often a person in her place attracts a man like Mr. Wilson. Yes, indeed. A man like Mr. Wilson. Shall I call her? 
I'm sure no, it's no, all no, right. No, 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 please, please don't. It's, uh, it's better this way. Uh, will, will you be good enough to give her this for me? And, and should she ever feel unhappy, uh, tell her just to close her eyes and say, squirrels to the nuts. You remember this, Mrs. Maley, won't you? Mm-hmm. Very good, sir. Goodbye, Mrs. Maley. Uh, goodbye, sir. I will be on the terrace with Sir Henry. Uh, very good, sir. Oh, good morning, Bolinsky. All up bright and early. <laughs> yes, and sadly, uh, I found out that I must go back to London. Well, oh, well, look, uh, that's ridiculous. Now, nah, you are the kindest people in the world. I, I can't tell you what it has meant to me to be here. Well, what's the matter with you anyway? Good morning. Oh, good morning, Lady Carmel. Oh, good morning, dear. What do you think of this fellow? He's leaving. Leaving? Oh, that makes me very sad, Mr. Belinsky. We're very sorry to see you go. So am I, believe me, Lady Carmel. Oh, you're coming back, you know. Oh, I hope so. Oh, that's absurd. You've got to. Oh, no, Henry. We must leave that to the professor. Well, hang it all. I can only tell you both that you've made me very happy. I'm very grateful. Your bag, sir. Oh, thank you. And I have taken the liberty of ordering a car to take you into the village. It is at the door, sir. Thank you, sir. Ed. Lady Carmel, let me say goodbye to you here. Goodbye, Mr. Belinsky. Now, look here. We're going to write to each other, Adam. Oh, certainly. Uh, what's your address, Adam? Uh, oh, uh, just, uh, just uh, Belinsky, uh, London. Hmm? Oh, oh you, you might add uh, general delivery. They, they know me there. Well, goodbye <laughs> and thank you. <laughs> Good chap, that. A fine man. So appreciative of everything. Oh, how he loved that nightingale under his window. <laughs> mm. Belinsky. London. General delivery. Mr. Belinsky. Mr. Belinsky. Oh, where's Mr. Belinsky? He's just left, Clooney. Oh, I didn't have a chance to say goodbye to him. And look what he gave me. Black stock and silk stock and sofita silk, too. And so is the tops. Oh, Mr. Belinsky. Mr. Belinsky. Mr. Belinsky. Mr. Belinsky. Mr. Belinsky. Clooney. Clooney Brown. Here I am. Oh, Mr. Belinsky. I, I want to thank you. They're beautiful. Why didn't you say goodbye to me? You know, we might never see each other again. Yes, I, I know, Clooney. Oh, it's, it's, it's kind of awful to think of. Yes, it is awful, Clooney, but how is Mr. Wilson? Oh, he's better. Was he sick? No, he was upset about his mother. Mr. Belensky, I disgraced myself last night. What did you do, Clooney? Well, you know what plumbing does to me. I just can't keep my hands off it. And last night I didn't either. Oh, I, I don't blame Mr. Wilson. He said, with his standing in this community, he can't afford to have a wife who's subject to impulses, either to pipes or to himself. And that was when he banged on the table. He's going to ask his mother to give me another chance. That's very kind now, isn't it? I'm certainly going to watch myself. One can't be foolish and have a place in life, can one? Come on, get in. Well, where, Mr. Belinsky? The train. Get in. Get in? Oh, get in. Well, all right. I, I have no tickets. That's all right. We can pay at the other end. I haven't any money. I have. Well, where are we going, Mr. Belensky? General delivery. Are you expecting a letter? Always. That's what's so wonderful about general delivery. Let us pour into it. Millions of them. Greetings from all over the world. Oh, I've passed it many times and I've never thought of that. You do make one see things. <laughs> and among all those millions of letters, there might be one letter for... for us, Clooney. Might be very disappointing, but it might be good news. Might be from America. Mr. Belinsky, you sound as if you like me. Ah, Clooney. Clooney, if I were rich, I would build you the most beautiful mansion with the most exquisite and complicated plumbing. And right in the middle of the most elegant housewarming party, I would hand you a hammer and say, ladies and gentlemen, Madame Cluny Belinsky is about to put the pipes in their place. <laughs> Madame Belinsky? Well, that's as good as Mrs. Belinsky, isn't it? Take off that apron. Oh, all right. Now, take off that silly cap. Oh, here it is. 
Now, watch, Clooney. Out the window with them, you see? That means just one thing. You will never again have to serve three meals a day. On the other hand, you might not have three meals a day. <laughs> sometimes maybe only one. And sometimes maybe only none. I don't care. As long as we eat together, Mr. Belinsky. Uh, just for that, we're going to have three meals. With hors d'oeuvres and champagne and snacks between. You know what you've done to me? I was going to write a book. The Economic Causes of World War III. Well, with luck, I might have made just enough money for myself. But now, I'm going to write a bestseller. A murder mystery. A murder mystery? What's it going to be about? A murder. <laughs> a man gets murdered. Who killed him? Who did it? For 365 pages, I won't know myself. But when on page 366 it finally comes out, will I be surprised? And so will millions of others. Clooney, this book will make enough money for both of us. Oh, but Mr. Belinsky, what if there should be three of us? Then I'll write a sequel. But why limit ourselves? I'll write a serial. Oh, Mr. Belinsky, I don't think I'll have much time for plumbing. <laughs> And so ends our Screen Director's Playhouse presentation of Clooney Brown, with two fine performances by Dorothy McGuire and Charles Boyer. Ladies and gentlemen, at the beginning of the program, we promised you an important announcement. It comes from the president of the Screen Director's Guild of America. And so it's my pleasure to introduce him to you now. The Academy Award-winning writer-director of the 20th Century Fox production, Letter to Three Wives and All About Eve, Mr. Joseph Mankiewicz. Thank you very much. If all this talk about an announcement seems to indicate a secret, that's exactly what it is, up to this moment. It concerns the winner of the Screen Directors Guild's second quarterly award for directorial achievement. That means the Hollywood film directors have scanned each other's work with a critical and appreciative eye. They have voted, and they have decided that the most brilliantly directed picture of the quarter is Sunset Boulevard and that the quarterly award belongs to its director, Billy Wilder. I take particular pleasure in presenting it to you, Billy, on this program, because the director of Clooney Brown was a close friend to us both. We were both his protégés. The late and great... Ernst Lubitsch. Here it is, Billy. The silver plaque of the Screen Director's Quarterly Award. Put it with that Academy Award you earned for the last weekend. Thank you, Joe, and all my fellow Guild members. I know all directors are so intent on their own pictures that, uh, well, when they applaud the works of a colleague, it's the finest compliment a director can receive. Thank you so much. Good night. Thank you. Next week, the Screen Director's Playhouse brings you one of Hollywood's most delightful couples, our play, Mrs. Mike. Our stars, June Allison and Dick Powell, with Screen Director Lewis King. <laughs> Clooney Brown was presented through the courtesy of 20th Century Fox, whose latest release is the Technicolor production, Halls of Montezuma. Charles Boyer may soon be seen in the 20th Century Fox production, The Secret Pen. Dorothy McGuire currently may be seen in the 20th Century Fox production, Mr. 880. Clooney Brown was adapted by Nat Wolfe. The Screen Director's Playhouse is produced by Howard Wiley, with direction by Bill Karn. Portions were transcribed. This is Jimmy Wallington speaking, and inviting you to listen again next Thursday to Dick Powell and June Allison, starring in Mrs. Mike with Screen Director Lewis King. Archie invites you to visit Duffy's Tavern tomorrow night on NBC.